what is your name? Kathleen Campbell, also known as Kathy Campbell. And are you an expert in rocks of some kind? I'm an expert in rocks. My current expertise is hot spring rocks, but I got my start working on undersea cold springs, also known as hydrocarbon seeps. Okay, so are we alone in the universe? Are we alone in the universe? Well, we ask that question every year in my first year class, my second year class, my third year class. We're all asking that question. Uh, are we alone in the universe? Well, just statistically speaking, it seems like we shouldn't be. But uh, there's also, we haven't sorted out yet, in, as far as I can see, whether there's a possibility that we can have life more than once. So in, a, in other words, just because the conditions are ripe um, doesn't mean that it's going to take off. So from a statistical point of view, I'd love to think that we're not alone. Okay, you said statistics. Now, what you're doing in your head is doing lots of planets and then multiplied by the probability of life. And you're saying that this over is overcompensates for this. So uh, why do you do that? Why do I do that? Because 20 years ago, it was science fiction to think that we had exoplanets, that we could even think about you know, habitability on exoplanets. And so now we're facing the reality of many, 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 many exoplanets. So you've so increased this number, but you haven't changed this number. The other number hasn't changed. So why do you think that this overcompensates for that? Then? It may not, but uh, it, it gives me reason to continue the search, I guess. And I'm also a fossil hunter, so I've got plenty to do in my own solar system anyway. And I'm really happy if we find little green microbes instead of little green men or women. Okay, so if we find little green microbes elsewhere, you think we would then be not alone? Yeah, from my point of view, for sure. From maybe the public's point of view and what they think about, you know, what NASA's hiding, no. But from my point of view, uh, Earth version 2.0, if it's microbial, that's fine. You know, if you look at Mars, for example, you've got 5,000 minerals on Earth. You, you look at Bob Hazen's work and 350 minerals roughly plus or minus on these rocky inner planets. Well, life didn't take hold, so we don't have 5,000 minerals. So the, the mineral diversity and the mineral evolution alone is very exciting for a geologist. A planet completely evolves alongside life. So you think we have a good uh, survey of the number of minerals on Mars? Pfft, not yet, but we're doing a pretty good job with all the beautiful orbiters at this point. We but know a implied, lot more. You implied, though, that when we do do a better job, it will not be as many as Earth. It will not be as many as Earth because of the oxidation and all of the crazy things that went on with oxidizing, uh, all those cations that can do all those different tasks and microbes just push it along, and so we have this explosion of minerals. There's no doubt about that because of Hazen's work that Earth is unique that way in this solar system. So mm -hmm. for me... It's like ah, mineral evolution, that means planetary evolution, and, this, and when you have a lot of diversity, you've got life. That, to me, is exciting. It doesn't matter to me if it's microbial. So you think that instead of having a Lovelock chemical disequilibrium test for life, you can just do mineral diversity tests for life? Why not? Why not add to our, our, you know, our quiver, have another arrow that probably we can shoot be, at the problem? Probably because in exoplanets, you, don't have, you can't measure mineral diversity. I'm in just this. wishful thinking. <laughs> Certainly in our solar system, I'm happy to, you know, to, to explore that further. But there must be a correlation between mineral diversity and the chemistry of the atmosphere. Yeah, certainly. And maybe somebody's going to sort out how we can do that one day. Okay. That's in, in your neighborhood. Yes. In the question, who are we alone? What's the, who's we? We? Uh, uh, you mean life. Do you mean I asked the question and you interpreted it some way. I'm asking how you interpreted it. So we, meaning life, I mean, we could say we, the planet, but that can't be true. There's lots of exoplanets. So no, I think most people assume life, whatever the definition of life any is. Any type of life. Any type of life. Not human life. I do not mean that. I mean any type. Okay, how about alone? What does alone mean? Well, alone, uh, well, it depends on how far out you want to go. But you've got the solar system to look at, and then you've got our near, sort of near neighborhood environment. And then it just keeps going out from there. And if we're expanding away from each other, one another, then now's the time to be looking for that other life, isn't it? Some people think if we, even if we find microbes, we're still going to be alone because we can't communicate with them. Yeah, but well, You're not in that camp. I'm not in that camp okay. because I sort of have my own special communication with rocks anyway. I've always been like that. Is are we alone an important question? I think it is. Because? I think I know with when I think about my own students, I think when they don't think about who they are, where they're from, like their connection to the land that they live on, let alone the planet they live on. There's the issue for me, is that if they are disconnected, then I don't think you have a very fulfilled life. I know I'm making a huge leap here, but I think people who do make that thought process, who do go, okay, I'm from somewhere, and this means something, that seems to, in the, in the 60 grad students I've had and the hundreds and hundreds of other students I've had over time, and the little kids I've talked to and the grown-ups, 
I notice that people who have some sense of kind of who they are and their place in the universe seem to be in general, and I'm extrapolating wildly here, but they just seem in general to be happier people, at least more well-grounded people. Happy. This is my, my generalization. So you wouldn't take the Socratic step of saying the unexamined graduate student life is not worth living? <laughs> I think that's a bit too far to go. <laughs> okay. Maybe if you're focusing on your dissertation, that's all you really can do. All right. But I do think it's really important that we step back and look at our context and our place. So the question, are we alone, is important because it gives you a context in which to put yourself? Which to put yourself, in which to put your planet, in which to put what you're doing to your planet in context, to get a sense of, I think, the humanity of the oneness of us all. No one can deny that seeing an Earth rise from the moon changed the way all of humanity saw the Earth. I mean, if you've seen that image. So for me, it's that kind of feeling. So you think the people who know where they came from and have a scientific understanding of how they got here are better stewards of the planet or something? Don't know. Maybe not, because there's a lot of people who, don't, who are non-scientists who get some connection to the land. But I think for people who live in cities, who are in modern society, who forget, who think that everything they want to buy comes out of the gas pump or out of the store, mm -hmm. I think for them especially it's very important. And we're missing out also on uh, origin stories and origin beliefs and origin um, uh, evolution that other peoples besides the ones who buy things out of cans in the grocery store have already come up with. And I think there's a whole diverse view on where we all come from. And I think it's all relevant. So you're looking for life. What is life? Do you have any idea what you're looking for? What is life? Man, that is just the most loaded question ever. So I'm a paleontologist by training. And so, you know, we definitely look for life on Earth, fossil life. And the further back you go, the more controversial it can be. So the more multiple lines of evidence you need to use to try to trace this, this elusive thing. Mm -hmm. And that's without even talking about things like viruses or, uh, or mules because they can't reproduce. So not even getting into the biological definition of life, but even the paleontological definition of life and species is fraught. Can you find fossilized viruses? Uh, I'm not aware of any, although somebody might have found them. So we've already, like, the record is already wiping out a whole bunch of things. And um, I feel like, so we're looking for the obvious, and we're looking for what we know. And we, uh, maybe, you know, some people sort of traipse into that other territory of stuff we don't know. But I do believe that those, all those possibilities are possible. We can't just throw one out because we don't know about it. So, yeah, even with fossils, we already have huge issues the minute you go into rocks that are 3 billion years and older. Do you think life is getting more complex? Well, the fossil record tells us that it did get more complex. What it's doing right now, I don't know. There are some people who believe that the next species beyond us is half metallic or computer or robotic. So, you know, that's out of the realm of anything I know anything about. But we, if you look at the fossil record, you see from primitive to more complex. That's along our lineage. Our lineage. What if, if you look at a current E. coli along its lineage? How about that? Now you're starting to get into more biology than I know about, but uh, I guess people now talk about things like epigenetics. There's other types of evolution. There's, it's not just the Darwinian. So I think there's more for us to uncover, that's for sure. Okay, so the answer to the question, is life getting more complex, is, what's the answer there? I would guess it might be. How do you define complex? Hmm. Well, uh, good question. How might you define complex? How might you define complex? <laughs> mm, when I think of paleontology, which is what I really know, then you're adding, you know, you look at trilobites, nautilus, and us. So and there you've got, complex. yes, you've got serious complexity, let's say, in the eye. But I don't believe that there was a creator who suddenly made the eye, mm -hmm. you know, because we see those transitions in the geological record. And when we don't see them, you know, we always like to say, well, that, the reason we don't see those transitions is because of preservation. So you're talking about morphological complexity, not chemical complexity. Chemical complexity, I don't know enough about it to be able to comment. Okay, and if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat you had to spend this to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Wow. Well, I mean, there are some people with the hundreds of millions doing that right hundreds now. Hundreds of billions here. But this is hundreds, hundreds of billions. billions. Yes, hundreds of billions. How would you spend it? Well, I would probably, I would throw, a, I would do buckshot. I wouldn't just throw it into one thing. I wouldn't just do SETI, and I wouldn't just do look for fossils. You'd have a diversified portfolio. Yeah, I'd have a diversified strategy. portfolio <laughs> search strategy. And I'd, I would support, really, experimental work on the origin of life. I would, you know, not just theoretical. And, um, yes, I would try to throw some money about how we might get to the next solar system. SETI? 
they're diversified now much more than they were orig originally. So they have diversified as well. So you would, would you put any of your $100 billion into SETI? Uh, why not? Take a look, see. Would yeah. you use it to buy microscopes to look for nano-alien spaceships in this room? Wow, maybe not. Do you think we're living inside of an alien? Uh, I was asked that question, are we part of a table leg for an hour-long radio interview that we opened up to the public? That was the very first question I was asked. Uh, or the Matrix movie, you or know. The Truman Show. Are we in a? Are we in? Yes, yeah, so or the Truman Show. Yes. Or are we in a computer program? Yes. And you know what? We don't actually know if this is more. If there's more than one dimension, we actually don't know. And I, I, I'm sure that we don't know. So that means that it's possible. Okay, so you spend some fraction of your hundred billion on trying to figure out whether you're inside of an alien. <laughs> <laughs> I guess somebody who could do it in a sort of scientific way. I think. Yes. Now, one thing about astrobiology is we're always looking for things that have evolved multiple times independently. And the idea is if mm. we find that on Earth, we, that becomes a good candidate for us, what we should expect elsewhere. Do you, do you agree with that? So multiple lines of evidence or multiple origins? Multiple independent origins of eyeballs or flight or multicellularity. Sure. Uh, I have a good example of that because quite, I'm quite a fan of this. And that is that there's a big debate out there. Did life evolve in hydrothermal vents in the deep sea? Or did they evolve in hot springs, which, of course, is my favorite thing. But... I, why not both? Mm -hmm. Why not both? Uh, it may be less plausible. People are beginning to think, gee, you know, what are we going to do about the diffusion problem in the vents? But there are some, there's some interesting ideas out there that need to be tested. And so my feeling is let's not narrow ourselves down into one little niche, because if we do that, you get trapped into your mm -hmm. one idea. And I've seen that in paleontology, and that's where people fall over. But presumably, we have good reason to expect that both of those environments would exist on any, almost any, wet, rocky planet in the universe. Hey, we're seeing them out in those icy moons. Every drawing of those okay. has a hydrothermal vent. Okay, so I want That's imaginary that's a given. at the moment. Now let's accept we have planets, we have hydrothermal vents. How about life now? How are we going to get life out of these things? Good question. What do you think? Well... Uh, you know, right now I'm looking at the wetting drying of subaerial environments, but you know, there are issues with that. If you are just inside the rocks a bit, that's a way to do it. So I think I would combine some sort of subaerial wet drying situation with also protection. So right. that's, that's the way I see it at the moment. Now, are you talking about how life got started on this planet, or how did life get started, or how does life get started? There's a big difference between did and does. <laughs> right? Okay, did for us, yes. but we always are using these models to go out into space. You see it all the time. I mean, everybody's looking under the Antarctic ice now because they're all going to go to Europa. So, did so equals this does. Is, mm, I'm not sure that it, it's like saying does form equal function. You know, that's a loaded question. So, um, you know, you, you answer that. You're more of a biologist than, than even I am. But the bottom line is that we've got a few things to start with. Uh, but is there life in the clouds of Venus today? People want to know that. People are going to go there and check that out within the next 20 years. Well, I can you, guarantee you, you that said they will. That we have we don't have life on Earth's clouds, so. Uh, yes, uh, it's all just dead stuff that's been washed up in there. Now, so yeah. Anyway, so the the point is that you've got to have other. You've got to have a bunch of ideas. I hope they're well grounded. I hope the experts are going to come in and say yes, this is plausible. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. But I'm really willing to allow it to be in multiple types of settings, multiple environments, and mm -hmm. let it arise. Let them arise in different places. How about uh, human-like intelligence? Do you think that's something that uh, would evolve again somewhere else? Sure. Because? Uh, well, I guess my feeling is why, why do we think that we have to be unique? And w since we don't know whether there are other dimensions, like we're the chair leg of a table, then you've got to allow for the possibility of intelligence to arise more than once how about, as an outcome. How about sulfur-crested cockatoos? Heck, if I know, how about, you know, robots that are, you know, self-intelligent and have taken off of the planet? Have you seen the movie Her? Mm. So, I, you know, sci-fi often does pre predate what mm. we're able to do in, in, in science. So I'm not willing to just say just what I see is the only thing that's possible. Mm -hmm. That for sure, I know. It's for me personally, there's potentially more. How about do you think like cellular life evolved multiple times on Earth or multicellular life evolved multiple times on Earth? Some people talk about these things as if they were independent. Some people say, no, it's not independent. Do you have an opinion on that? I guess my feeling is, and it just comes back to, again, you know, which environment. I feel like, why couldn't life evolve in multiple times? Because we've got convergent evolution all over the place now. So yes, so I definitely believe it. Why not? Why, why, and maybe multiple times if the bombardment story is true. But all that convergent evolution has a common ancestor. So, so apparently, but if it got wiped out, we don't know what that other ancestor was if you see what I mean. So it might have started and stopped, and we never have even a record of that. Right, but all the examples of convergent evolution that people cite, like convergent, uh, independent 
evolution of eyeballs or flight or something, yes, all the common ancestors. absolutely. But so, that doesn't preclude life having evolved more than once on Earth. Right, right. Okay, what yeah. kind of aliens would you like to find? Close your eyes, deep breath, emotional, Kathy. What kind of aliens would you like to find? Nice, fuzzy, friendly ones. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't need a brain, do they? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, I'd love to be able to talk to aliens. Nice, fuzzy, friendly. So you're looking for animals then. You don't, you don't uh, like alien or they fungi, can be, alien plants, or, alien bacteria. You don't like them. You want I don't animals. mind them. I think <laughs> it would be more expected that they're fungi or microbes. But yeah, fuzzy be, means hair, and then you're well, still looking for animals. So you're looking for like uh, Yoda. Or Yoda, or uh, <laughs> you know, some kind of robotic thing. I, I, I'm really that would be. I'd love to be able to use this bit here mm. to communicate and find out where they come from. Remember Jodie Foster? She mm -hmm. goes and asks them. Where did we all come from? And they said, we don't know either. Oh, is that right? I yeah. didn't know that. In the movie Check contract? it out. They, it's really? such a bummer for people like know. us. Is that the, they actually said, the movie, we don't know. Book? It's in the movie. I didn't see that in a movie. I, haven't, I need to read the book, obviously. Oh. But no, it's in the movie. Oh, no, I didn't see it in the movie. I saw the movie. I didn't see it. It's anyway, in there. In this, book, in this movie, at three times, it says, are we alone? And they say, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Mm. What do you think of that comment? Uh, well, so so there's a huge space out there. What's the problem with that? I mean, it's getting bigger by the minute. I don't, I don't. I guess it doesn't worry me. I don't lose sleep over it. I'm not a cosmologist, though. That would really freak me out. My brain would just warp. So I like don't thinking. Don't think it's an awful waste of space. No, if, I don't think it's an awful waste. No, it doesn't bother me. And besides, see, I feel like every time I look at a scanning electron micrograph, which are the teeny tiny ways that we can look at fossilized microbes, for example. I see entire worlds in that. So going into the inter inner world yes. is as exciting for me uh -huh. as you know cosmology might be for someone else. But you wouldn't invest in microscopes to look for nanospacecraft. Oh, well, nanomicrobes for sure. Nanospacecraft, <laughs> I'm just not sure how we're going to detect them since we haven't seen them yet, but yeah. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? The, um, if we're, oh, do you mean the probability and then uh, why we look around, we look around why, why haven't they colonized us yet? I guess the two possibilities are, um, well, there's lots of them. Seth went over it all the other day. But okay. basically, um, you know, maybe they have been here and we haven't really realized they've been here. Maybe they started our civilizations. There's a lot of, obviously, conspiracy theorists who believe that. I have no idea because I haven't really looked into it that much in detail. Okay. Uh, but why aren't they, well, we, maybe they're just too far away. Too far away. Yeah. And what do you think are the public's or students' biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? I think the biggest, and, and Seth pointed it out, a huge number of people, certainly in the United States, think that you know we're hiding the aliens and that they've been found already. So I think that is a huge misconception. Okay. And do you have any advice for students who, or anybody else who wants is thinking about becoming an astrobiologist? Yes, I do. Actually, I really do. And that is that, um, and it's just my own personal opinion. I really feel that a person should uh, study a a particular area or areas. And so my a couple of my best students both happen to major in biology and geology. And they just did stunning work as master's students. And then left New Zealand, a tiny country, and went to some very big and important universities and had very amazing postdocs and both have great jobs right now. So from the academic point of view, what they did was they focused, and in this case, on two majors, rather than saying, I'm actually majoring in astrobiology. I don't personally believe in that. I really feel like You've got to meditate on a problem. You've got to do some research. I also believe in getting a master's. I'm not going straight to PhD. I don't believe in that trend in the U.S. where they're getting rid of masters all over the place. I really feel, and I think it, I've had a lot of graduate students, I feel when you have a chance to come to grips with a problem where your supervisor doesn't know the answer, we don't know the answer, and you're, make, you're, you're making new knowledge here and learning new connections, that changes you as a person, and that makes you much more uh, robust to either become a success, successful astrobiologist, or you might go on to do something totally different where you use your cri critical thinking skills to uh, help countries find out uh, what's the difference between fake news and real news. Well, there's a lot of people who nowadays, I realize, don't know the difference. If you're a critical thinking person, you can get to the bottom of anything. So don't major in one thing, don't major in 10 things, major in two things. No, just <laughs> my feeling is don't go too broad because astrobiology has the danger of being too broad. There are so many different fields that address astrobiology. So find the one and not just chase your passion, but develop your passion. Develop what you're good at. I was good at certain aspects of geology and not other aspects, and that's what I ended up excelling at. And I, of course, I loved it because I was good at it. So you've got to stick with it. It is not a two-minute soundbite, this stuff. If you're going to really go in depth like some of the people at this conference, 
I really see, you know, their, their love of what they're thinking about and their willingness to be open about their ideas and to change them. And that's something that some people get ossified in. They become fossilized in their ideas. So these are the things that I would... And you don't like fossils. Well, I love fossils, <laughs> but not fossils who stick to one idea. I've seen not it a lot. fossils. <laughs> yeah. So, so these are hard questions you're asking. They're really difficult questions. And if we had the answer, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be doing something else. We'd be having a holiday on some other planet right now with our alien friends, the warm, fuzzy ones that I want to find. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think it's great to ask everybody because, you know, some people are a little more open about are we a table leg and others aren't. And I just think, wow, the sky's still the limit. We, because we can only, whatever we can observe, that is science. What, what's beyond science? I don't know. But I'm not going to shut out the possibility that there's something beyond science. And are we alone? I don't think we are. Because? But because I just intuit my entire life. And so my, all my great successes with work have always been in intuition. So my intuition tells me we're not alone. But I don't actually know what that means. But I'm willing to leave it open.